Podcast. The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Hello and welcome to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio with me, Sam Hales. The Profile is the show where we delve into a person's life, faith and testimony and it's brought to you in association with the UK's leading Christian magazine, Premier Christianity. That's the magazine I edit and I would love you to have a free sample copy. Why not request a copy of the latest issue? Just go to premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. But today on The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio, I'm delighted to say I'm speaking to the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, Tim Farron. Tim is currently the Lib Dem spokesperson for communities and local government and the MP for Westmoreland and Lonsdale. He's a well-known Christian, enjoys the misfortunes of Blackburn Rovers or the fortunes of Blackburn Rovers, depending on your point of view. Tim, it's a pleasure to have you on. Welcome to the show. Sam, thanks for having me. So tell me, what does the average day look like for an MP? Well, there is no average day, really. At the moment, um, there are no votes in Parliament. Uh, I think we had a vote last week and that was the first for five or six weeks. But I mean, a day, if I, if I try to look at the closest to uh, typical as I can make it, uh, my week is kind of split in two halves, really. So Monday morning, do things in the constituency, uh, train Monday lunchtime, and then I'm in, in Parliament really Monday afternoon, evening through Tuesday, Wednesday, mm. and I'll probably come back as soon on Thursdays I'm allowed and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday in the constituency Sunday off and mm. that's my my normal kind of week um, but in Parliament I guess you know people look at the House of Commons they see an empty chamber or they see no votes taking place and they think let MPs are a bunch of lazy so-and-sos they might be right in some circumstances <laughs> but it, essentially what would we be doing and so, so today um, uh, I, I was at Treasury questions so I was able to ask a question about child poverty and minimum wage in in my constituency um, and you know throughout um, the average day in Parliament you'll be spending time uh, trying to lobby ministers to change their mind on certain issues to try and influence outcomes, talking to the local and national media, uh, hopefully standing up on my hind legs in either Parliament itself or in Westminster Hall, talking on the kind of issues that affect our community, which might be ambulance numbers, might be the lack of investment in eating disorder services, it might be issues to do with mm. policing in Cumbria yeah. or everything else you could uh, you Very could mention. varied. So, look, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, my, my it, the shorthand is I spend my time up north gathering the ammunition and right. down in London I fire it, if you like, you know, find out what the issues are, yeah. what the problems that need solving, go down to London and do my it, best it to is, fix them. It is interesting. We have a political system in this country that means every politician is grounded in a local constituency, a local area. How important do you think it is that we, we have that system? Because presumably that should, at its best, enable MPs like yourself to know what the real issues are for, quote unquote, normal, everyday people. It's a good question. I think that, um, I mean, obviously I'm not a fan of our electoral system. Um, I think first past the post gives you extor- d- d- distorted results. It, it means that probably 70 plus percent of people who vote in an election needn't have bothered. Um, so it's, and it gives very unfair outcomes. But having said that, the tie of a local MP or a local councillor to the community that elected them is, on paper at least, a good one. A very large proportion of MPs don't live in the constituencies. Um, and uh, I remember Shirley Williams once telling me that she went out uh, as the MP for Stevenage years ago um, that uh, for, a, for a Sunday lunch with her, her daughter and um, uh, in, to the neighbouring uh, constituency. And there on the notice board next to the pub that they went to, it said, uh, I can't remember the name of the MP, uh, we'll be visiting the constituency in the third Sunday in <laughs> July and we'll be driving through this village sometime about 2pm. And this is... <laughs> This was his visit yeah. uh, to the constituency. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily follow right. that because you've got you yeah. know, a constituency system. But for you, it clearly does. Yeah. You. you want to spend a decent part of your yeah. week in the constituency. H- home is there. I mean, so, I mean, I'm, I, I'm Westmoreland's man in Westminster. I'm not Westminster's man right. in Westmoreland. Yes. And, um, and so, yeah, home is undoubtedly uh, up in, in Westmoreland where Rosie and the kids are. Um, and it's where life is. And, mm. and Parliament is a very wonderful place, but it's a place where I, I come to do a job and so I don't do much in the way of having a social life or anything really at all. When I'm when I'm down here, my job is to use every hour God sends uh, to do uh, my job and then scurry back north as soon as possible. And 
carve out some free time yeah. for family and everything else then. So we always like to go back to the beginning of a person's life on this show, hear some of their early upbringings, which I understand for you uh, was in Lancashire. So yeah. tell me a bit about growing up. What was family life like for you in Lancashire? Um, so uh, my parents were very young when they got married um, and uh, and very young when they got divorced. So uh, I was not quite five when my parents split up. Um, uh, very, very close to my dad, but we were raised by my mum, uh, or at least we live with my mum. Um, it was also a wonderful person. Um, I was not churched um, as a youngster. My dad's Catholic and I may have gone to church with him. I certainly remember going once with him when I was about 12, but it was never part of my of my life my growing up um very close to my mum's parents my grandparents and it was through that side of the family that i did an absolutely you know uh scandalous thing and that was be a person from preston who supports blackburn Rovers. <laughs> um so it turns out that my preston supporting side of the family just didn't bother getting me to games and then uh my uh my cousins from darwin if you've ever heard of the place which is the slightly leafier end of blackburn okay. it's not part of blackburn it's darwin or darren as they call it there darren <laughs> Um, uh, and I had two cousins about 10, 12 years older than me and they would come home from matches when we were there at family gatherings particularly on Boxing Day with their rattle and their blue and white scarves and they were very glamorous, they were older than I was and I thought I want a piece of that um, and so I supported Blackburn Rovers despite coming from Preston and still do <laughs> um, uh, and um, you know so not not brought up as a Christian um, uh, although I think you know if you're brought up in the 1970s I was born in 1970 uh, England were still world champions for another fortnight oh, okay. after I was born <laughs> um, and um, uh, so um, I think being brought up in the 1970s I think um, whilst I didn't go to church, you were raised by a generation that had done. Mm. Um, and so awareness of faith and of Christianity and of the church was was there. Rel religious education was 90 percent, you know, um, scripture back in those days. So I think my, me and my generation will have learned stuff about the Bible, but I never made a commitment right. of any kind. Yeah. Um, but it was a happy childhood. You know, it was not a. a we were not in any way well off. Um, uh, parents suffered bouts of unemployment. Um, uh, so quite a tough yes. time growing up um, financially. But I, one of the marks of a wonderful parent is that you don't realise you were poor until you grew up and you and you look back and think, oh, yeah, OK. Mm. So it was a happy childhood. I uh, didn't have holidays, um, didn't have lots of stuff, but I had a lot of space. It was a kind of urban, suburban, rural environment. I was on the main road between Leyland and Preston, uh, the West Coast main line on the other side of the main road. But behind us was a farm. Um, uh, and behind that was the gas work. So it's very sort of a Lancashire feel to it. And, um, uh, you know, the kind of industrial and the rural uh, equally together. And the farm, well, I was mates with the lads on the farm. And so my first paid work ever was hay baling. So it's a weird sort of <laughs> juxtaposition of a, you know, really a very urban setting, yes. you know, terraced house, all the rest of it. So yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a picture. So a very happy upbringing, um, if not a, a, a yes. not very well healed one. Where did, uh, where did politics come in? Because you joined the Liberal Party age 16. So I, very young. I, yeah, so I just try to trace back. And I think when you talk about um, your life quite a bit and I suppose when you're in politics you do particularly if you've been a leader and they try and get you to tell your story it's so important to tell the, the actual story rather than the one that's been doctors want you to tell but uh, there's a linear sort of set of developments I think the two things one is I was interested in in politics but there's a particular thing that politicised me um, and that was um, I watched Cathy come home when I was 14 uh, which was made four years before I was born but it was it, I'm pretty sure I saw it on television as a repeat um, and um, you know, those are the days when there were only four channels on the telly and you had to get off your backside to go and change channel. There was no. <laughs> what was remote. it about for those who haven't so seen Kathy it? So, Cathy Come Home was um, made by uh, Ken Loach, who's the same guy who made um, I, Daniel Blake. And it was utterly groundbreaking um, a piece of um, cinema, really, although it was a television film. Right. And it was about Cathy and her husband, Reg, working class people. They. Um, uh, are struck first of all by Reggie's bout of illness. Um, he therefore loses his job. They lose their home. They're in temporary emergency accommodation. They split up. Kathy's in emergency accommodation with the children, two little children aged, aged under four, I think. And in the end, she's turfed out of that. And the the, the credits roll at the end uh, with Kathy crying out, "You're not having my kids," as the social services take them off her. Um, and you know, and then comes the, the 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 phrase on the screen afterwards: everything that happened 
than this film really happened in the last 12 yeah. months. Now, you know, um, first of all, I knew people like Kathy. We'd had a family stay with us for the best part of a year, just a year or so earlier. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and that felt exciting to me at the time, but the penny dropped that that family was staying with us and we had no room. We were, you know, two bedroom, um, two up, two down, Terry's house, just me, my mum and my sister. Um, to have three extra people staying with us was a big deal. That's because a friend's marriage had broken up and they had nowhere to go and they were literally um, uh, destitute otherwise. And um, and it, uh, and Cathy looked like my mother, just to add right. wow. <laughs> uh, to so the this had feeling. had So massively, so I, basically at the end of that, we're pre-internet, there was no website yeah. for me to go to visit, but you were invited to send a stamp to trust envelope and a postal order. Kids, I'll tell you what that, that is. <laughs> later on if you really want to know um, uh, for £1.50 which was three weeks pocket money I would normally have spent it on a Smith single um, or something like that and join Shelter um, because that was what I was advertised at the yeah. end of the um, uh, the thing which made me think it must have been Channel 4 because it feels mm. a little bit more pretty political so that made me interested in politics thought this is awful must do something about it same time 1980s not dissimilar to now in that the, the politics felt extreme and lively and awful and exciting at the same time um, and uh, there were two televisual events every week that everybody seemed to watch wonderful thing about those days yep. you know everybody four channels, four channels everybody watched the same thing there was two things that everybody seemed to watch Thursday night top of the pops Sunday night spitting image so we go into school on a Monday morning talking about these grotesque puppets mm -hmm. of all of our major political characters and people who would never have the first idea who Neil Kinnock or even Margaret Thatcher and certainly not David Steele and David Owen were could do impressions of them wow. uh, based upon these, these impressions characters. Impressions of impressionists. Impressions of impressionists, exactly. Um, and uh, so I think that gave, you know, so politics was interesting to me um, and I slowly took a side. Um, uh, I remember watching live aid in 1985 and being struck that yeah. you know that what was that the famine in ethiopia was not being was not an accident it was a consequence of human wickedness mm. and human and political failure um yeah. and therefore i should do something about it and so eventually um uh, when i was just started sixth form i i joined the liberals for a variety of reasons but mainly because i thought I'm a yeah. liberal. And then two years later, age 18, you become a Christian. So tell me that story of what led up to that. Because again, yeah. a very significant moment in, in your life. Yeah. You would have picked up two from your childhood. You could say yeah. joining the liberals and then also becoming a Christian. Very significant moments in your teenage years. Oh, yeah. I mean, I guess they're the two things that have, have, have um, been the infrastructure of my entire adulthood, haven't they, really? And um, so I joined the liberals in my first week or two weeks at sixth form college. Uh, none of the schools in my part of the world had sixth form. So everybody went to the same huge sixth form college as university is not as big as runch or tertiary college in leyland all the <laughs> mates went there whether they did a levels or vocational so it's a great place a vibrant place um so uh, joined the liberals there i became a christian in the summer after i'd finished at sixth form and before i went to university and wasn't quite as straightforward as i make it sound i mean so um where to start i uh, so I, I became a Christian in, in Singapore, of all places. Wow. So I was a, a completely poorly travelled uh, person. Um, um, I, we'd never really been anywhere uh, abroad. I'd been, I'd been once when I was 12 to a Spanish island for a week on a package holiday. That was the only time I'd been overseas. So towards the um, end of the academic year, uh, as I was preparing for my A-levels, my mum comes home from work. She's by this time a, a lecturer at Preston Polytechnic, now the University of Central Lancashire. And she brings the bomb home, bombshell home that she and some other colleagues have been seconded to a college in Singapore. And so my sister and I end up going out with her after I finish my A-levels. Uh, we end up being put with a family friend in a nice detached house that belonged to that college in the south of the island, a place called Bucket Teema. Um, and um, that was all great until we realised there was only three bedrooms. Um, and there were four of us, and none of us were prepared to share, <laughs> uh, particularly not me and my sister. Um, and so they cleared out the junk room for me, um, uh, which held which a perfectly nice room. But it had all the stuff that the previous tenants had uh, left in the house. And they'd also worked for the college. So, you know, amiable exit and all the rest of it. And these guys were Christians. Um, and the one thing they didn't take out of the um, room were the books. Um, and it rains quite a lot in Singapore. And I read a whole bunch of stuff, stuff you'd probably categorise as apologetics and prophecy, I suppose, now. I remember reading stuff about Daniel. Um, uh, and uh, to cut a very long story short, um, the penny dropped with me. Um, oh, crumbs, it's all true. 
um, uh, and that Christianity wasn't a kind of a, a worldview that I could either agree with or not, or, or not. It wasn't like a political party manifesto where, oh, I like that, so I'll join. It was something that was a, a, a dynamic faith. If you'd asked me who Jesus was the day beforehand, um, I would not have dismissed him. I would have uh, said he was probably a historical character, but what we know about him was so foggy uh, and vague and you know, lost in the depths of time. And um, he was a good teacher. Um, and it was tragic he died so young. That's mm -hmm. something like that. I wouldn't have dismissed his existence. Um, you, if you'd asked me, was I a Christian? Yes, did I have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Definitely not, mm -hmm. for all the reasons I've just sort of set out, really. Sure. And I certainly thought that Christianity um, and the practising of it was beer, w weird, uh, unattractive, restrictive. Um, and I, I knew a guy at sixth form called Jack, who was the college Christian, bless him. <laughs> and he was a lovely guy, really yeah. lovely guy. I really liked um, uh, Jack, despite the fact that he'd been a, Lib Dem, a liberal and he joined the Labour Party. But oh. I forgave him that because <laughs> he was a nice fella, actually. And he was a drummer in a band, um, but he was a Christian, a committed Christian. I remember he... Um, uh, he got photographed um, holding a pint of beer at a college do, and it, the next college magazine was a picture of him on the front cover holding a beer. And it just said his name, and it's a sin. So people liked Jack, Jack, but they mocked him. Yes, and I felt that the faith that he held to was, yeah, weird, restrictive, yeah. unattractive. So this is quite a turnaround to be yeah, reading so books I, in I'm, Singapore. Yeah. I'm not the I, I I thought of myself. So my mum my mum would describe herself. Uh, she's sadly no longer with us. She became a Christian before she passed away. Thank thank God. Um, um, but um, she um, would uh, call herself the nouveau poor. You know, it's a nouveau riche, no class and loads of cash. And my mother was absolutely the opposite. Um, so you know, very much the Guardian reading liberal, yeah. the intellectual sure. skeptic about everything, mm -hmm. and raised me absolutely yeah. to question everything. Yeah. Um, and so I, I had, I, I did not see myself as the kind of dupe who'd fall for mm. religious nonsense. Mm. Um, and uh, and I still don't consider myself the kind of dupe <laughs> sure. who falls for religious nonsense. But I think by the grace of God, I'm someone who knows the truth when he sees it. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because sometimes people can be a little bit down on apologetics and say, well, you know, you can't you can't just argue people into believing this stuff. And yeah, it sounds like, f from your point of view, from your story, a huge part of you becoming yes. a Christian was the more intellectual y yeah. arguments, really well-reasoned, thought through, there are good reasons to believe this is true. Yes, um, in in part, and certainly the, the, the fulfilment of prophecy and the fact that, you know, Daniel is clearly written when Daniel says it's mm -hmm. uh, written and clearly talks about events that happened afterwards that could not have uh, been matched up. When you look at the stuff that was written regarding Isaiah or in Isaiah that is the the address, if you like, of, of, of the Christ, um, uh, undoubtedly written mm. before that time, yeah. not possible to have made it up afterwards. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just know that from carbon dating of the, uh, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that would yeah. do. I think the thing about apologetics, first of all, um, people become Christians because the Holy Spirit moves them to become Christians. Um, but God uses us, and it's a great privilege, um, in order to help deliver that message. And I think that there's, you know, that we, um, God graciously understands the place we're at. And the danger is in 2019, you know, intellectual snobbery and pride um, is a is a real challenge. Um, the ego uh, shattering co uh, consequences of the gospel being true are enormous. And so God graciously gives us things that actually work with the things that we hold dear and our, our intellect. I just simply say that the books I read were not finger pointing argumentative apologetics. There is a danger that we like to, you know, you've heard it said, you win an yeah. argument, you lose a soul. Yeah. Uh, my, my job is, and, and any of our jobs as Christians, if you're trying to win someone to take Jesus seriously, you're not trying to beat them in an argument. And if you do, you don't expect them to become Christians. They're going to resent you, and that's and that's not that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. But calmly, graciously, politely making the case for the gospel based upon the historical yes. evidence of the apologetics, the fulfillment of prophecy, um, it. it it had a massive impact on me, and therefore yeah. I know it probably does with others. Your um, your interest, I guess, in politics, as I say, predates you becoming a Christian. So once you became a Christian, did you find yourself rethinking your politics? Um, to a degree, yes, I think. But you stayed um, in the Liberal Party, and I obviously did. have done since. Oh so. yes, I mean, so I remember being at a, um, a, 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 a Christian Union. It was a Navigators um, 
barbecue or a garden party or something that I've just made sound more flash than it actually was. <laughs> but it was at a um, you know, a post grads. Uh, somebody they, they actually had a garden. So anyway, <laughs> um, and there's a couple of guys who are twins who are members of our navigators group in in Newcastle, and um, uh, they uh, one of them just came was having a chat about this, that, and the other, and he said. Um, you need to knock that politics stuff on the head. It's a mucky business for a Christian to be involved in, or words very similar. Uh, I certainly remember the phrase, it's a mucky business. And over the weeks, months, years following that conversation with this guy, it did give me some pause for thought. And I guess looking back, um, first of all, the world's a mucky place. Everywhere you are, you know, um, everything since Eden has been a mucky place. doesn't matter whether you're in politics, whether yeah. you're... In business, whether you run your own, you know, your corner shop or whether you drive a bus or you teach or you're a student or you're retired, the world's a mucky place and you're put in it. And we're not told to be hermits and to go and be separated from the world. Yeah. Um, we've got to be careful we don't get too immersed in it, um, uh, that we, um, you know, lose our, our sharpness and our faithfulness. But nevertheless, um, so I think that um, being involved in politics is a, is a good thing for a Christian to do. It's not a mandatory thing. Um and I certainly took the view that, you know, I, I am a liberal. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the things that um, is a practical application of that is recognising that religious tolerance and indeed tolerance of those who don't hold a faith is integral to any society that dares to call itself liberal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So nevertheless, I mean, it's it's a little bit of a generalisation or a stereotype, but I'm sure you you and I can think of Christians who, let's say, are very passionate about right of centre views. So you will hear Christians talking perhaps about family about mm. sexual ethics about euthanasia and we can also think of christians who are let's say campaign very strongly on left-wing issues environmentalism might come up a lot yeah. um or there might be issues um surrounding war or refugees and rightly or wrongly these things are seen as left-wing mm. what do you think about that are, are you some are you someone who'd want to seek seek to bridge that divide and say as christians we should care about all of those things and not just those more on the left or those more on the right so i think you make a very good point there i think I mean, I, you know I, my politics are you know liberal center left um uh but i think that um the danger in uh with the church is that people will be so i mean amos is a, a wonderful book um and i got to um grip to that a little bit a few years ago and i i it's a uh it's a harsh uh, story that mm -hmm. Amos uh, tells to um, his people um, but you see the comprehensiveness of God's righteous anger against uh, all that's wrong mm -hmm. and that could include the social wrongs it can include the inequality it can include the um, the complacency and disinterest of the of the wealthy and the comfortable in the face of poverty and exploitation and it also um, shows anger at what we might refer to as personal morality and and yes there'll be those in the church who will focus only on the latter and think that any concern about um, inequality or poverty is just um, you know a fig leaf for not believing the gospel um, and then on the other side those people who will be so concerned about poverty and inequality they forget about the, the, the real welfare of every human being which is that they need to know Jesus um, and so that's a rebuke to us all mm. um, uh, either what God is telling us is the truth mm. and we need to humbly um, you know, uh, fall before him, yeah. um, or we're nitpicking and deciding we yes. know better than God, and that's that's yeah. that's not on. I wanted to touch on the the kind of moment we're we're in when it comes to politics and society and how people view mm. politicians. You mentioned already, um, they can I think very sadly be this view that oh, politicians they're all liars, they can't be trusted. And you've said you know as Christians this is an area that many people are called to, and I think that. Uh, you know, church leaders and Christians who speak about politics need to respect the fact there are Christians working and seeking to, to do good in this area. Nevertheless, at the time of recording, uh, we've just seen uh, a milkshake thrown over a, a prominent, at least at least mm. one prominent political leader. Do all of us need to get a bit better at modelling good disagreement yeah. rather than resorting yeah. to violence, even low levels of violence yeah, no, such I, as milkshake throwing? I'm, I was publicly uh, very clear in my my opposition to throwing milkshakes at anybody yes it's not a brick yes it's not you know a gun or a knife but these things can be a sliding scale mm. um uh, and, and does, by all means does that begin because i've i've heard church leaders say oh politicians they're all as bad as each other they're all liars mm. is that where that kind of thing can begin we've got to be careful with our language well we should be very careful with our language yes um i mean yeah we're all sinners um and we're all 
capable of dishonesty um uh every every part of society um and i you know so i i do um have great concerns about the levels of integrity in our politics but you could say the same in the media in business mm, yeah. and yeah, education and everything else and, and dare we I, say I, it amongst I, some church leaders yeah, as well, well there's been plenty well, of scandals there as well uh, possibly but i think for, from my my point of view is not it's not about pointing the finger elsewhere it's about remembering that in politics 90 percent of what i do i think uh, is about serving the people who elected me in westland mm. um uh, all of it is but 90 percent of it is focused very much in terms of casework um and i think to me, the the real attraction of politics, to me particularly now, uh, is service. Mm. It's how you can make a difference for people, people who are in those desperate circumstances. So, you know, to get you take you back to Kathy, come home. What what suddenly upset me, um, broke my heart, was Kathy's plight herself. Yes. But what motivated me to do something about it was anger at the indifference of the officials uh she was passed from you know from one pillar to another post and uh and 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 i i resolved now and I, i've watched kathy come home twice in my life once when i was 14 and once when i was 46 um at the 50th anniversary of it um and it made me cry both times mm. but the second time much more um i was much more clear that, that the thing that motivated me was um a desire to make sure that Every and any Cathy that comes my way will never get turned away. We will not give up on them, however hard it might be. And so I think, um, uh, you know, I, I hope people who are Christians see that politics is a way of serving people um, on a micro level like that mm. and in a larger level as well. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't critique our politics. Sure. But I just think we maybe ought to be a bit more um, thoughtful about how we do it. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. I'm Sam Hales with you this afternoon for The Profile. And you've been listening to my interview with Tim Farron. Lots more to come from Tim Farron right after this. Premier Christianity magazine in this month's issue. We have an exclusive peek inside a modern Christian utopia when we visit the Bruderhof in East Sussex, a 300-strong community where all possessions are shared, crime and divorce are non-existent, and life is centred around Christ. Plus, we discover the evangelists reaching out to goths, metalheads and Satanists. And we say goodbye to Soul Survivor after 26 years of the UK's best-loved Christian youth festival. All this and more in August's issue. For your free copy, visit premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. World-class Bible teachers, including Albert Moeller and Alistair Begg, are coming to London. Ligonier Ministries' first ever UK conference is taking place this September and you can go free. You'll get two tickets worth £118 completely free of charge when you subscribe to Premier Christianity magazine. Subscribe now and get your free tickets to the Light of the World conference at premierchristianity.com forward slash subscribe. The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Welcome back to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio with me, Sam Hales. I'm the editor of Premier Christianity magazine. That's the monthly publication that sponsors this show. If you would like to check out our latest issue, which features the write-up of this interview with Tim Farron, plus a tribute to 26 years of Soul Survivor and our review of Stranger Things Season 3. It's all in the latest issue. Why not go to premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample and type your details in. We will be delighted to send you a free copy of the latest issue. There's no obligation to subscribe. Simply have a look. premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. Time now to rejoin my conversation with Tim Farron. Let's listen in. You rose through the ranks of the party, were elected leader in 2015. So take me back to that time. I mean, you must have been delighted to be leading this party that you'd, I guess, grown up in. Yeah, I mean, you, you become leader of a party that you'd been a member of for, at that point, you know, nearly 30 years. Um, great privilege, but you also realised, I mean, I, I always knew that if I was to become leader, the chances are becoming leader of a party that was in the wasteland. Um, you know, we'd been reduced from, you know, nearly 60 MPs down to just eight. Wow. Uh, and I still don't believe 
believe that there was anything inevitable about our survival. Mm. Uh, I, you know, the, the eight of us who remain could just simply be the equivalent of those folks hanging onto the, you know, the funnel of the Titanic. Right. Um, we yeah. were, you know, we, we, were, we were not dead yet, but we were about to go down and meet <laughs> our friends in the icy depths. And I think that was could easily be impossible. So um, it was a huge challenge. Yes. Uh, my job was to try and lift a party that was on its backside and worse and give it some purpose, you know, clarity and try and build towards mm. re-establishing some credibility. Yep. Um, and uh, so it was a massive challenge. So it was a, a great, a great honour. Looking back, would you pick out any particular high points um, of your time as leader, things that you particularly wanted to achieve? I mean, perhaps what you just said, it, it can be difficult to measure how successful you were in that. But are there moments you look back and say, as leader, I'm so pleased I achieved X, I, I, was, I was clear that our two main objectives um, were um, to rebuild at the grassroots, local election-wise, and to have a very clear mission. Mm. Um, so credibility and clarity. And and we achieved that. Mm. Um, so uh, some will listeners will and readers won't agree, but I, I took the view... Uh, I did something that David Cameron never did. I prepared for what might happen if the referendum went the other way. And I had an evening uh, with some uh, colleagues in Westminster... And we kind of wargamed it and we took the view, look, there's no point being on the fence. We we need to be Marmite. Mm. So we chose, what we believe, and we do believe Britain's place is better in, we are far better off in Europe for so many reasons, to say, well, we respect, you know, the democratic outcome of the referendum, but we disagree. Mm -hmm. um, and we certainly think that um, it's not right to uh, then leave politicians to stitch up what leave now means mm. um that that must be put to the people in a further yeah. referendum so and we were utterly pilloried and ridiculed but our membership doubled wow. and uh you know at the time of speaking you know the party's just had its best local election results um in living memory um and that would not have happened if we hadn't done the brave thing of being clear picking a position i think you know if you're on 30 percent, you can afford to be blamange when you're on four percent with eight mps you cannot uh we chose to be marmite not to everybody's taste, uh, but to some people's taste. And therefore, we still survive. Yeah. And I guess that decision, that quite brave decision you, you took, arguably, to say we're going to have a position on Brexit, a very strong position that Britain is better in the EU, that policy has continued to this day. It's something that you set in motion. So in that mm. sense, that's quite a... You had quite an influential role in deciding to take the party in that direction. They've stayed in that and direction. And it wasn't easy um, uh, because, you know, you, you, we just lost a referendum and lots of people would say, well, let's just get on with it. Uh, and and I can understand that. But I, I generally think that um, the, the the best thing for the country and the best thing for the party um, was for us to be very clear. Mm. Um, I think, you know, there's too many people who say what they think the electorate want them to say. Yes. Um, and it's far better to be honest mm. and say what you think. And... So yeah, the party's membership um, rose to its highest level level, sure. um, and uh, so yeah, uh, it was. I think we, there's plenty of things that we did well. What did I feel was? I mean, there's lots of stuff that I did as leader that I uh, whether enjoyed is not is, is quite the right word, but um, but I did a I made a particular point of seeking to be a voice for refugees mm -hmm. um, and spent an amount of time at the camps around um, southeastern Europe, in particular on the islands uh, in Greece, Lesbos in particular. Um, and I think, it, you know, I, I've often been as sceptical as anybody else about, you know, politicians going off on, you know, uh, study missions and... Photo you know, opportunities. Total, yeah, photo opportunities and also jollies. Right. Um, I promise there's nothing jolly about uh, that trip. Nice island, but I mean, awful things that we sure, saw. Yeah. Um, but I think if you want to speak with passion and conviction on something where you've got a view, there isn't a substitute for actually getting out there and getting amongst mm. them and spending time literally bringing the boats ashore and talking to people through an interpreter um, about what had made them leave. Yeah. Um, and and so that was um, it's a reminder. So I think le leadership, uh, you know, I did loads wrong, of course, um, but uh, leadership, I think, is about uh, clarity. Um, but you also need to have a sense of uh, depth of conviction of what it is you're talking mm. about. Otherwise, you're just some bloke who read an sure. article and is just parroting it. So two years after becoming leader, you stepped down. And it's worth revisiting, I think, what you said in, in that speech. You said, from the very first day of my leadership, I faced questions about my Christian faith. I've tried to answer with grace and patience. Sometimes my answers could have been wiser. 
The consequences of the focus on my faith is that I found myself torn between living as a faithful Christian and serving as a political leader. To be political leader, especially of a progressive liberal party in 2017, and to live as a committed Christian to hold faithfully to the Bible's teaching has felt impossible for me. Now, this, of course, came after repeated questions in the media about your views on homosexuality. But reading those words back, I mean, that must have been an incredibly difficult time. Well, I think uh, those seven weeks of that 2017 election campaign was an incredible pressure cooker. It was a, a real privilege, you know, um, uh, you know, to, to, to get to lead your party. A great privilege to let, get to lead your party through a general election, which not every leader does. Um, that's the equivalent of not only getting that picked for England, it's you know yeah. getting picked for England and captaining <laughs> them through a World Cup. Even if you only get past, don't get past the group stage, <laughs> uh, which is probably how it was for us. Um, it's a bit more like Scotland then. Um, sorry, Scots. Uh, but I think um, we. Uh, so yeah, it was a, it was a great, it was a great privilege, um, but it's a real pressure cooker, uh, and you know, for me in particular. Um, so in the, in the end, yes, it was a, it was a tough decision, but it wasn't that tough. And once I'd made it, uh, and I made it during the campaign, then mm. I parked it, so to speak. Right. Um, I just felt going forward, um, what good does it do the party if their leader is just constantly hounded on issues yeah. about you know of of, of faith? Um, I thought it doesn't do the party any good at all. So I could only be a good leader. I re- I, re- I reasoned to myself if I was basically prepared to kind of. Yeah. Car crash my faith, and and, yeah. neither, and the party deserves a good leader, and 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 I, um, God willing, want to stay steadfast as a Christian. And at that point, with the experience I'd gone through, as I say, maybe you know somebody wiser than me would have navigated it differently uh, and better. Um, but I just felt, you know, um, I, my choice is to be a, a a bad leader or a bad Christian, um, and that's a rubbish choice. So let's not be leader yeah. and seek to be faithful. Yeah. Did you feel like it was your own decision? Though? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't I mean, pressure to no. say. Well, I mean, I, I suspect after the election there'd been some people who um, would, but I'm also. I mean, this sounds a bit pompous here. I'm a hundred percent confident. If I'd wanted to stay on, I'd have stayed on. Right. Um, uh, so no, it was it was me, um, and um, but I feel, you know, very much at peace with the decision I made um, because. You know, whatever job you do, if you're a Christian, um, your job is to serve the Lord diligently and to get on with it. Remember Daniel and his, his, his the decades of faithful service he provided in Babylon. You know, being being faithful to his God, but not, so far as we can tell, standing out exceptionally. Mm-hmm. Not not uh, feeling under such scrutiny that he had to do something dramatic until towards the end and we know the story of the lion's den um and that's a reminder for all of us as christians that you know martyrdom is something is a it's a glorious thing i mean uh, but but don't seek it for pity's sake um you know uh, do your best to serve as quietly as you can as diligently as you can in the setting that you're in Uh, so you don't need to be the Mm -hmm. bus um driver who has to you know share a tract with every other passenger who gets on you probably get sacked for that and probably rightly you know um but you know but you can be a faithful witness um uh, but having stopped being leader and being someone who is a relatively well-known christian the opportunity for me to use that platform to share my faith is an is a enormous blessing, yeah. enormous privilege. And yeah. I wouldn't have had it if I'd not been through what I went through. So mm. God knows what he's doing. I wonder if, if the media, if you lay any blame at the media for this. And the, and the reason I say that is it, it's been said before that if you're a Catholic, you'll get quizzed on abortion. If you're a Muslim, you'll get quizzed on terrorism. And if you're a Christian, it seems you get quizzed on homosexuality. Um, so I, any politician who complains about the media is like a a sailor complaining about the sea. It is what it is. I think there is a broader issue in society where there is a a failure to uh, understand faith um, and a creeping lack of liberalism in in quarters that would call themselves liberal. I'm not just talking about my party. I'm talking about, you know, the media and Mm -hmm. indeed all all, most most of the political parties. The assumption in 2019 appears to be that the absence of faith is neutral, that the holding of a faith is a kind of wacky eccentricity that we'll just about tolerate, uh, but only just about. Um, And I would say that's illiberal and um, silly. Mm. (laughs) Um, 
because there is no such thing as a neutral point of view. Um, I'm somebody who believes in a secular society. I don't mm. believe in church, a, a clerical state. I very much strongly oppose a clerical state. I even think the Church of England, respectfully, should be disestablished. More of that later if you really want. <laughs> but just as I oppose Christianity being the state faith, I also 100% oppose atheism as the state faith. Right. And that yes. appears to be where we've in reality got to. Right. Um, and I just think that's intellectually... Um, uh, indefensible and illiberal. A real liberal society is one where, with some tension, but with all, but with peace, is different worldviews mm. held together in the same space. Yes. Not one dominant one yeah. telling all the other ones they've got to genuflect towards them or even get out of town. Yeah. I think your experience has raised a huge question for a lot of people, though. Not just Christians, but I hear Christians asking this a lot. Is Given what happened to Tim Farron, is it possible for a Christian who holds traditional biblical views on something like sexuality, is it possible for them to progress in politics, certainly to be a party leader? Because some people have looked at your experience and suggested things have now got so bad for Christians that this particular view will not be tolerated. So two things, really. Um, and we talk about me first as the least important of the two points. Um, and it's this. Uh, so I served as an MP so far for 14 years. I was president of the party as it was historically involved in coalition government for uh, most of the time in government. I was leader of the party. So I know it's only the Liberal Democrat. However, um, all of that does tell you that if there is a glass ceiling for Christians in politics, it's reasonably high. Um, <laughs> and uh, and as I say, someone wiser than me could have uh, could have navigated a, a path uh, through it. So you do um, think that, is, that, so, that was possible? Of course. Possible. And then secondly, okay. the more important issue is mm. this notion of Christians in the West being persecuted. I think Christianity being misunderstood. Yeah, I never marginal. said persecuted. You didn't. Quite no, you're right. No, you're quite, <laughs> well, and I think we are misunderstood and yeah. we are marginalised okay. um, to a degree, but it's nothing compared to... The real persecution elsewhere and we need to then reflect how how is it right for christians mm. to respond to that marginalization and it's not to be tetchy and whiny and ratty mm. it's to be gracious it's to turn the other cheek it's to model the forgiveness towards others and the grace towards mm. others that they don't show to us yeah. um i how how we respond um to being shouted out and labeled and all the rest of it um is massively important mm. and to go back to what we said earlier on about the, how you do your apologetics yeah. you know this is an opportunity for you to win an argument it's for you it's opportunity for you to demonstrate integrity yeah. and to take it on the chin to use the modern parlance yes. or to turn the other cheek to use yeah. the biblical one just to raise one more one more question on the the kind of the big picture level on this and that is around this idea of there being a thought police because you pointed out during this time that if you looked at your voting record on lgbt mm. rights you were very in favor if you look at your your political record of campaigning in favour for, for equal rights for people and yet the questions seem to be about yes but what's going on up here in your head what's going on in your beliefs and is there this concern that we've created a, a culture of a thought police where it doesn't matter how you voted what really matters is what you think and we're going to quiz you on what you think and we're going to take you apart for what you think and yeah. not how you act well I mean, that's an interesting um, observation on, on where we might have got at the moment but I think I think in the end um, the the critical thing for us to remember in a in a free society is that we need to defend people's rights to be members of whichever minority it happens to be. Um, I think it's important for Christians to understand how the world sees us. Mm. And we, we complain of or we observe, shall we say, religious illiteracy in this particular age. And that's fair enough. Um, but I think we also need to understand that Christians ourselves can be guilty of political and cultural illiteracy and not understand understand quite how we're heard. So we need to have a compassion. What we want mm. is people to hear the gospel, um, not to have a row with them yeah. about where the culture is at the moment. And remember that, you know, Christianity is always countercultural. Mm. Um, uh, and in you know, and in times past the place where the culture and the gospel would have rubbed up against each other most uncomfortably would be over slavery or legalism or militarism or materialism. And it appears today to be against sort of issues to do with you know, personal morality and um, uh, you know, radical individualism. Um, and in the next generation, it'll be something else. The point is that you know, Christianity is always going to be challenging. It is a enormous affront to your ego, to my ego, to everybody's ego, to realize that we aren't our own mm -hmm. um, and that we are answerable to one yeah. higher who loves us immensely but is 100% just and pure 
and we're not. We haven't spoken yet about uh, church, local church. Great. I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about what that looks like for you. And especially given the issues we've already discussed, whether there's a kind of support there that you've come to rely on in fellow Christians in your local church of, of helping of helping you, I guess, navigate some very tricky issues. Church is massively important. We go to uh, Pastor Evangelical Church in um, the town of Kendall, which is the big town in South uh, South Lakeland, about seven miles away from away from where we live. Um, you know, very much focused on Bible teaching, um, and uh, so a great a great church, really well led. Um, one of the challenges, and this is a thing I would you know I was talking to a new a Christian MP, a recently elected MP who was a Christian, um, one of the things I would point out is that um, the, the nature of our work and how our weeks work yep. means that you end up not being in a small group. You end up not being in right. Bible study or right. in a yeah. house group, or at least if you are, you don't go to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's been a real problem for me and for my family. And um, I think, you know, in terms of some of the issues uh, where I may have not, you know, uh, performed as well as as I, as I might um, uh, over the years some of it is down to the fact that you can become a coal out of fire if all you're right. doing is going on yeah. a Sunday um, so it's really important mm. to have close fellowship with other Christians and uh, but my church is great um, um, so I meet you know with with you know folks at church um, fairly often of apart from on the Sunday and it's just great to have so my advice for everybody doesn't matter what you do really stay rooted in a community of, uh, of Christians with whom where you're, you're hearing the Bible preach truthfully and where you are accepted and loved. I'm aware that almost all of the major political parties can claim some kind of Christian root. I've heard certainly Labour and certainly Conservative members of Parliament tell me about the wonderful Christian heritage that exists, and I think you know, genuinely doesn't in those two parties. I haven't heard Liberal Democrats talk so much about that. Well, well they might not talk about it, but they should. I mean, <laughs> who, who st- where did the Liberal Party come from? It came from the nonconformist evangelical movement in this country. That's the only reason it existed. It's fascinating uh, to me that... that all those three, all those three parties, and presumably some of the other ones as well, can claim some kind of Christian influence. But I wonder, mm. you know, given we look at the statistics, we know less and less people go to church, less and less people identify as Christian. You know, you you could you could say that despite walking round even mm. even the Houses of Parliament, and you can see Christian artwork, and you can see Bible verses in the floor of central lobby, that actually for the average person in this country just aren't that bothered because we've become more secular yes um and that's an interesting observation i think that uh, i mean so the house of commons business starts every day with prayers mm. and they're quite good prayers yeah. and they're very good prayers <laughs> um but you realize what it's all about if you turn up at eight o'clock in the morning um and queue up and the door opens you can put your prayer card up your seat and then two or three hours later on um there are prayers and if you turn up for prayers as well, that seat's yours for the day. So uh, it's not that MPs are still terribly, terribly pious. It is that that is basically the parliamentary equivalent of the German. <laughs> the Germans putting the beach towels in the sun lounges. Um, and um, so, but uh, there is a. I think that obviously, so Christian heritage is an important part of sort of parliamentary process and procedure. Yes. Um, and I and I wouldn't want to tip X that out. Um, but we are in a society where. Um, uh, you know, the Christian influences has receded. I think certain churches, churches like mine, for example, are seeing very rapid growth in membership, particularly from younger people. Um, and others are seeing enormous decline and have seen enormous decline. Um, and we can all speculate as to what that's all about. Uh, my sense is, you know, if you look at where the church is growing, it's where the church is serving people in in deep need and sometimes mm. in under ser- serious persecution yeah. and i think you know one of the things that probably is the is a real challenge for the church in the west is the fact that everybody's so flaming comfortable um and the realities of life death and what com- comes next can just be kicked down the road because mm. everything feels all right and yeah. there's so many other things that do entangle ensnare and direct your attention elsewhere and we should be aware of that so don't don't we mustn't think that you know christianity is on some trajectory to be fizzling out you know if you read to the end of the book uh-huh. you know it ends really we flaming the, well we know how the um, story ends. and and it and and it's um and so i mean you look at so you know the church is is, is growing net yep. growth on planet earth is colossal right um the fact that there is growth in this or a decline in this particular yes. uh, part of the world yeah tells you probably more about this part of the world than it does about the gospel what's been the best day of your political career and what's been the worst day oh wow um so uh worst day i think the worst day if i'm honest with you is being um 
at a at a count when you've lost and you feel responsible to everybody else that you you know you haven't managed to uh, achieve the result you wanted. So I stood for Western Lonsdale in two thousand and one and didn't win. Um, and being aware that a whole bunch of people who put their backs into it thought we might win and you've just got to raise them uh, when you're not feeling very raised yourself. It's fine to lift mm. someone. So when, you know, when the party was down after the 2015 election, I felt it was my job and my mission to lift them and it wasn't hard for mm. me to do it. Um, but it is hard to lift your team as it was in June 2001 when everybody's been defeated, including myself. Uh, you just didn't feel like it, but you had to keep going. And the best, I mean, there's lots to choose from, really. Um, but um, a lot of the a lot of the issues are are a lot of the best moments are when you achieve something spectacular for somebody. Um, um, and so I'll tell you one thing that just so the day after I stepped down as leader, I went up to primary school in Langdale, which is the most beautiful place, um, um, village of Chapel style in the Lake District, um, and the whole. Um, school could have comfortably fitted in this little studio here and so about maybe 30 kids um, and they were all asking me quite sensible questions quite serious questions about Brexit and farming and tourism all that stuff kids aged from 4 to 11 there um, and there was two little girls at the front who were about 7 and uh, they both put their hands up and the one on the left um, asked me uh, and I thought more serious questions here because she was very earnest and she said uh, Tim when will we know whether there are fairies so, <laughs> awesome question um it just because you unpick it it's not um are there fairies it's when will the select committee inquiry uh, finish its report so that was lovely but the thing and i say best days in politics this was just an example really because the other little girl then came next and she said um do you help people with their passports and i thought Random. We've just gone fa- done, we've done fairies. Run to pat right. So I thought, <laughs> drag your memory banks, Tim. I thought, yeah. As it happens, um, a few years ago there was a, a couple who lived locally whose son went to live in Brazil. Met a lovely lady. They got married, had a baby, but they couldn't bring the baby back. And we worked very, very hard. And eventually, we got the baby a passport, and it all ended well. She put her hand back up and she said, "That was me." No that was way. me, and of course everybody else in the in the audience knew, wow. um, and I had a little cry. Um, and it's just so it's little thing the the ability to make a difference in someone's life. When, when I'm trying to motivate people to go and win elections, it's not that it's fun to beat the other lot. Mm. It's that winning an election is your ticket to being able to change people's lives. So you know I can pick all the elections that I've won, and and you know and entertaining moments that I've had on. And I had a you know a, a, a laugh doing a celebrity. Match mastermind for Blackburn getting 100% of my specialist questions right on Blackburn Rovers um, great moments um, I, I love giving the leader's speech that was a, you know because frankly I'm, I'm I'm vain politics is just showbiz for ugly people um, <laughs> and um, so you know all of that it, 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 that's energising and exciting but the greatest joy is when you've done something for somebody that mm. uh, they couldn't do for themselves and that you, you transform someone's yes. life so it could be building some council houses fixing someone's passport sorting out someone's benefit yeah. that's what it's all about it's a fantastic story you did mention the B word Brexit though yeah. so we've got to go there um <laughs> Now, you know, some would say trust in politics is at an all-time low mm. because people in this country voted to leave the EU. The government at the time promised they would implement the decision. That has not been done. Mm. And now your party is campaigning to remain in something the country has voted to leave. Mm. How is that not a sweeping away and ignoring of democracy? Yeah. So I understand the argument, but I don't think it, it holds water. Um, in the end, what we voted for in 2016 was for departure and not destination. Uh, whose fault was that? Well, bless him, Mr Cameron, uh, who I think just expected this um, uh, this referendum to be a, a nice quick job that he would win and then his party would come together and be united again. That was the only reason we had it in the first place, by the way, and it's not worked terribly well. Um, and so there was no preparation whatsoever for what happened might happen to the UK in the you know 50% chance of us leaving the Euro- voting to leave the European Union. So that happens, and suddenly um, you know Britain has voted leave. But what on earth does that mean? I mean, you know, the six of us in our uh, family at home, we might all vote 100% uh, to go on holiday. Holiday means holiday. Um, uh, but holiday, it might turn out, could mean Cleethorpes. Nothing wrong with Cleethorpes. Um, or it could mean you know Barbados. Or it could mean you know um, yeah. Siberia. But either um, way, you're going to go on holiday. And, and, when, and at the I'm moment, not, we haven't. Do you left. know when we decide we're going to, when we discover it's Siberia, we might decide to think again. Um, and that's my point, uh, that the British people at the moment have indicated their will to leave through a referendum. 
I think the problem is that if the British government or British Parliament picks one version of leave, and there are several, mm -hmm. then almost by definition, you'll be picking something that is contrary to the will of the people because you can pretty much count the 48% against you for starters. And then even with you know Mrs May's deal, you'd probably find half those who voted leave say, I didn't vote for that. Or if you pick no deal, half those people who voted for leave will say, I didn't vote for that. And they're, yes. they're right to say that, by the way, because they weren't asked. Right. And so the referendum on the deal, or the people's vote as it's referred to, um, is simply our answer to a question that should never mm. have been put. If you were going to vote, leaving the European Union is an entirely plausible thing, but you prepare for it. And Mr Cameron made no preparation. There is no nice way out of this. But the least unpleasant is to put it to the people and, and decide, do you want this deal or do you want to remain? I think we're agreed the country's pretty divided over all of this. Who's going to unite the country? Um, so I think that um, I see no obvious sign of it, and so we better find a way of achieving it. And I think that um, you know, I'll be very careful with the language that I use, but I think the Conservative Party is riven, not because of its ideology, but because of its personalities. I see too many people making choices which are just about their career, not about necessarily the thing that they um, you know, politically believe. The Labour Party is very much in the in the grip of a of a movement which is you know of the hard left, dare I say it, which I think makes it probably unelectable. I might be wrong. Um, and so you're left in a position with a, a shambolic, extreme, divided government and a probably unelected and extreme opposition. Um, and so what I set in train as, as leader of our party was something that hopefully led to our survival and our return to strong and credible third party status. Great. But that's not good enough. Um, to my mind, there needs to be an alternative government. And that won't just be Liberal Democrats. You know, you've seen people like Michael Heseltine and um, coming out and said he'll vote Liberal Democrat in the European elections and uh, others in the Labour Party. I think we need to be um, not dominating, but the gathering place for people who think that um, the United Kingdom can be run in a more moderate and consensual, mm. may, consensual, consensual way. Yep. Uh, not may. Um, and, uh, and that's something I think we should seek to do. On the other hand, I think Brexit is a complete mess. But I also think that we shouldn't overstate the mess. Mm. Um, and bear in mind, the thing there's been that people... a lot of overstating the mess, hasn't there? Yeah. Really, I mean, some of the language has been pretty apocalyptic. Yes, I and mean, I think, I mean, I, th I do think you know it'll make us poorer, less less safe, and less important as a country. I'm certain of that. Um, uh, but you know how we speak to one another has to change. It has to be a uh, uh, we have to talk seasoned with grace, and and in terms of our politics as well, you know. People say over the years that the worst thing is that the people are apathetic. Well, they're not apathetic now. Everyone's got an opinion, um, and and that's a good thing. So I think we've engaged people. Um, those people who thought this would be straightforward mm. have been misled. <laughs> right. um, it was never going to be straightforward. Um, and my sense is that this mess, one way or other, will last for a generation. That is what happens when you seek a simple solution to a complex problem. Mm. What would you say to a younger version, perhaps of yourself? I'm, I'm thinking of a young young person today who, like you as a teenager, was very politically engaged and is thinking about a future, I guess, career in politics, mm. similar to one you've had, wants mm. to do well, is a Christian. What would be your advice? Um, your best, um, the most important strength to develop is, is knowing how to uh, appoint or involve the right people. It's the people you choose that indicate, you know, what your uh, strengths are going to be. And that can be the volunteers that are around you. Um, so surround yourself with good people who give you good advice and who do the things that you're not so good at, maybe. Um, but from a Christian point of view, um, don't go cold. Make mm. sure that you've got plenty of people around you um, with whom you can have good fellowship, who are faithful Christians and who will hold you to account. Mm. And make sure some of them, not necessarily all of them, are reasonably politically savvy as well. But don't only support around yourself with Christians. Um, it's important that um, we are there to serve all people. Um, I think the other thing is just worth bearing in mind, a kind of practical tip. So I'm, I'm blessed in the sense that uh, the internet wasn't a thing when I was young. Um, I think all of us need to be careful now that our every utterance is uh, is online. It's there um, for posterity and for an opposition to rake over. And one has to be careful what one says. Mm. Um, and some people think that's too much of an intrusion in our privacy, and that might be right, but it is, it is mm. what it is. Um, and so being careful with what you say um, and the opinions that you express and the way you um, contradict other people, 
um, is something we should all seek to do just so that, you know, you don't yeah. turn up at the grand old age that I'm at and, and find that you are hoisted by a petard that you strung up 30 years earlier. Good advice. And just before we go, um, tell me, what does the future hold for Tim Farron? You're going to be doing more speaking about issues of faith. I heard rumour of a book at one point. Is that I know, I No comment just the time being, but yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, uh, those rumours may or may not be true, but probably are. Um, I'm, um, yeah, well, look, I mean, I, the most important thing for me is to serve my constituents, and I love it. It's a, some people I think go from leadership or front bench roles back to being a backbencher and treat it like it's some terrible kind of loss of status and, uh, right. you know, um, a demotion. I think totally the opposite. Right. Um, being leader was a great privilege mm-hmm. and an honour. Being the MP for our area is a total joy. Um, uh, and uh, so I, I don't need to kind of uh, rouse myself in the morning to, to get up and do it. I absolutely love it. So uh, I'll carry on serving the folks of Westman as long as the people of Westman want me to serve them. Um, but I use you know a fraction of the time that I gave up having been leader and president and so on to um, to work with um, my organisation Faith in Public um, uh, and that job uh, that the role of that um, you know small organisation is to help me to speak openly about my faith uh, to share it to encourage Christians and hopefully to win a hearing um, from those who aren't yet um, but it's also about talking about the place of faith in the public square um, to challenge the myth of secular neutrality mm-hmm. uh, but also I suppose to support me in those things that I, I will call up an outworking of, of what I believe. And so, you know, issues to do with uh, asylum seekers, refugees, um, and how we uh, treat them and reach out to them and provide for them. Um, those things are, are supported by my work in Faith in Public. So yeah, um, and I'm out, of, I'm out of doing things like this, and it's a great blessing. And if I'd not been through the kind of trials and tribulations, if you like, of, of my leadership, um, I would not have... I'd not be in a position uh, that I am now where I can openly talk about my faith and, um, uh, you know, you, if, if you've, if you've, if you've, you've given up the thing that um, uh, perhaps you most wanted to achieve in life um, to me, to be leader of my party um, uh, and done it because there's something more important. Mm. It's so important. You then focus on that thing that is more important, which is mm. following Jesus. It's a wonderful place to leave it. Tim Farron, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm Sam Howes. You've been listening to my interview with Tim Farron. I do hope you enjoyed that. If you want to read the write-up of our conversation, it's available in Premier Christianity magazine. Ask for a free sample copy at premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. If you missed any part of this show and you want to listen again, you can get this show as a podcast. Check out the many interviews we've done on The Profile. Simply search for The Profile wherever you normally get your podcasts from or go to premierchristianradio.com forward slash The Profile. And if you are listening to this as a podcast, we'd love it if you could give us a rating and a review wherever you found this and let other people know about the show. Well, that brings us to the end of the show. Thanks so much for joining me, and we'll see you next time.